This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 6th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we try to add some clarity as to how much some are proposing to spend overall this coming fiscal year as the proposed increases and new programs start to pile up. Second, we put a proposed new constitutional amendment in context and puzzle over why two in the House majority have signed on as co-sponsors to it instead of supporting two other options. And third, we discuss the importance of the upcoming Willow decision, but emphasize again why it's not a cure for Alaska's fiscal situation. And now, Let's join Michael. The proposed spending uh, in what we're looking at right now is starting to pile up a little bit, starting to add up. K-12, defined benefits, child care, university. Uh, oof, man, there's some, there some dollars here in this big old pile. What are we talking about? Well, one of the things that, that's been noticeably absent in the, in the conversation, at least the conversation I've noticed, is, is somebody keeping a running tab on how much additional spend or how much total spending we're talking about uh, in the FY24 budget. People will talk about, you know, we need to do K through 12. We need to do defined benefits. We need to do childcare. We need to do more spending for the university. Uh, they'll talk about those in discrete, in discrete chunks, um, but, they, but they don't really total it up. So what I, what I tried to do, um, is prepare a spreadsheet, which is what I do when I try to understand things. What I tried to do was come at it a different way and look at the level of the PFD they're talking about and then use that to back into what the spending level is that they're talking about. Because all, most of these people are talking about leftover PFDs. So when you when you think about when you think about what PFD they're talking about, you can you can you can back calculate what spending level they're talking about. And it's, and it's pretty interesting. The baseline um, spending level, if, if we have no additional revenues, no PFD cuts, just, just run on trad re, tra, traditional revenues, the baseline spending level is about $4.2 billion. That is based upon current um, uh, futures markets, oil, oil futures markets, and based upon the estimate of what the other tax and, and other fees and other revenues are going to be. We're at about 4.2 billion. The administration has proposed 4.9 billion, uh, which is about a, uh, uh, a PFD cut of about 30 percent. Uh, if you if you look at it in terms of what's left over for the PFD after if you spend this amount and take and have to take the the deficit, the amount over traditional revenues, out of the PFD, what's left over for the PFD? And the administration has proposed spending of about $4.9 billion. That's the lowest end of the range that I'm going to talk about. That's the lowest end that anybody is talking about. Nobody is talking about the $4.2 billion, which is, the, which is the, the traditional revenue level. Everybody's talking about something above that, and the administration is talking about about $700 million uh, above uh, the $4.2 uh, level. POMV 50-50. If you adopted POMB 50-50 and the other 50% not used for the PFD was used for uh, government uh, government revenues, uh, that'd be about 
4.96 billion. That's what we would be talking about in terms of, of spending levels. Ledge Finance, uh, when they calculated the current policy, what they what they say is the current policy budget, that is continuing the policies of the last fiscal year, uh, cuts and, and additions, uh, they come up to about $4.97 $4 billion, which is very close to a, a POMB 50-50. So if we stuck with that budget, we'd be at about a POMB 50-50. Ledge Finance also talks about a current law uh, budget. The current law budget uh, pays for everything provided by current law, interestingly enough, except for the PFD. So all of the all of the, the school reimbursement, school construction reimbursement, all of the uh, various programs that have statutory calculations to them. Uh, that's what the that's what the uh, ledge finance current law budget is, and that's about five point three four billion. So we're we're about nine uh, percent at that point over the administration. Then the next level up is the FY twenty three budget, and this is the budget that you know spent everything they possibly could. We didn't think they could ever spend any more than the FY twenty three budget. So I. So I put the FY23 budget in there, and that's $5.68 billion. That would result in a, in a PFD cut of about 60%. We'd have about a 40% uh, PFD. And then there's and, and now we get into what people are talking about, people are in, in, in the legislature are talking about in their various current proposals. Senator Stedman's talked about a $1,300 PFD. So when you back calculate that into what that means in terms of spending, uh, the Senate majority is talking about a spending level of $5.81 billion. If you add all of their, if, if, if you add their K through 12 proposal, their defined benefits proposal, child care, all the other stuff, we're talking about a spending level of $5.81 billion. That's 19%, nearly 20% above what the administration's proposed. Um, and that's more than the FY23 budget. So, so we're breaking through you know, what we said, we could never spend more than, we'd never be able to spend more than the FY23 budget. We're already breaking through that. POMV 2575, which a lot of people talk about as a, as a way of setting the, the, the ratio between the PFD and the, and revenues available for government, 25% would go to, I'm sorry, 20, go ahead. 25% would go to government uh, or 25% would go to the PFD, 75% to government. That's a spending level of five point. Eight four billion dollars, and then you get to Zach Fields a thousand dollar PFD. What what's left over after a thousand dollar PFD? Six billion dollars uh, for government. Twenty three twenty three percent higher than what the administration's proposed. There, there's one other thing on that sheet I want to mention, Michael, before we start talking about, it, and that is the far right side, the okay. the, the 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 tax calculation. And, and this isn't this isn't proposing a tax, not proposing a tax. This is simply analyzing how much of the of of the funds are being converted in terms of PFD cuts. How much of the funds that otherwise should go to the private sector are being converted over to government? Um, and those numbers are are pretty astounding. We're talking about tax rates, and again, tax in the sense that. We're cutting the PFD. We're moving that money out of the private sector over to the government sector. And, and I've calculated these on the basis of Alaska adjusted gross income, which is the combined income of, of all Alaska families. The, the administration's proposing, even the administration's proposing a tax, a tax on the Alaska economy in the sense of moving money out of the PFD over to the government sector of 2.5%. Um, of of AGI of, of the of the revenues gross revenues of Alaska family gross income of Alaska families, uh, the FY uh, or the FY twenty three budget would be uh, six point or five point three percent, and Fields by the time you get up to Fields Fields's proposal would be a tax level on the Alaska on the Alaska on Alaska families income of six point five percent. We're talking about some huge tax burdens that that are being tucked away hidden by right. doing them as, as PFD cuts. And you look, you went into this backing into this saying, well, if they keep talking about these leftover PFDs, then what money is left on the table? And basically that's what you're doing here, showing that they could spend up to $6 billion on government, still give us a thousand dollar PFD, pat us on the head, tell us we're doing a good job and still be spending more than they ever have before. All the while still owing money to the 
constitutional budget reserve and everything else. And, and instead of being frugal with that, they're just basically spending every nickel that they can find and still trying to keep us quiet on the PFD. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, what Zach's doing is saying, oh, well, a thousand dollar PFD, you should be happy with that. I'll take the rest, government will take the rest of that. And that adds up to, you know, $6 billion that, that, that they've got to spend. Stedman, the $1,300 PFD, you know, Stedman said we could do all this and still have a 1300, still have a $1,300 PFD as if that's a good thing compared to the, the statutory, uh, 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 statutory, statutory PFD this year of $3,600. But Stedman said, Stedman said we could do all this and still have a $1,300 PFD. Well, that adds up. That adds up to shifting to government five point eight billion dollars more than the government spent in uh, in FY twenty uh, three after all the bells and whistles were were accounted for. So, I mean, they're talking about they're talking about some huge shifts, and they're hiding it. The thing the thing that the thing that I continually try to try to you know find ways to bring out is they're hiding it in terms of PFD cuts. It's a tax rate. Stedman's is a tax rate of 5.8% on, on Alaska family income. 5.8% average average tax rate across the board. Not we're not talking about top 20%, we're not talking about bottom 20%. We're talking about the average rate across the board. 5.8% tax rate on Alaska family income. That's what he's taking out of Alaska families uh, and putting by 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 cutting the PFD, taking out of Alaska families and putting it uh, into government. I, that's I mean, that's a huge tax rate. And, and for an average tax rate across across all income brackets, that's a huge tax rate, um, uh, probably one of the highest in the nation's highest in the nation. But we hide it. They try to hide it by calling it a PFD cut instead of a tax. And, and instead of calculating it as as what are you taking out of the income of Alaska families? They calculate it as, well, how much of the PFD do you get? How much PFD do you get? How much, you know, you're so lucky to get this thirteen hundred dollars. Right, it's, right. Well, of course, they look us in the eye and say, well, Alaska doesn't have any taxes, so you guys should just be happy with what we're doing. Again, uh, setting us up not only for not only gaslighting us on the whole fact that the PFD cut is a tax, but also setting us up for the future argument, which is, well, you guys just don't pay your fair share. So we need more taxes in the long run anyway. Um, Man, six billion, six billion dollars. I mean, that's a huge, huge number comparatively. Uh, I mean, I remember when 2014, when you and I first started talking about this, we were looking for them to try and guarantee that they were going to spend no more than $4.1 billion. The amount of money we're talking about here is just is so mind boggling. And the fact that these legislators are just like, yep, we need to we need to spend this. We need to spend it. We're spending more than we've ever spent before, but we still need to spend it. And you guys can just, you know, be happy that we gave you that we threw you the thousand dollar bone. Right. That's exactly how they're trying to sell it. I mean, Zach Fields uh, has proposed this thousand dollar PFD. Uh, it's one of the bills that's in that's in Ways and Means now, and he does this calculation of, you know, average PFDs over time. Zach Fields, who is the world's biggest cheerleader for you have to inflation adjust everything, does this calculation without inflation adjusting the PFD. Does this non-inflation adjusted calculation of the PFD. But it comes out to about a thousand dollars, and Zach Field says you ought to be happy with a thousand dollars. That's the average that, you know, all Alaska families have received over time, without saying, without, without, or without discussing, of course, how much is being diverted to government, how much of the PFD is being taxed and diverted to government, as as a result of as a result of his proposal. I mean, they've broken they've broken into the kitty the 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 piggy bank, Michael. They've broken into. With, with with Walker's you know veto and and the legislature's follow up uh, uh, ad hoc decisions on the PFD, they've broken into the into the piggy bank of the PFD, and just like the just like what we saw with the SBR and the CBR, and now with the PFD, it's just going down and down and down and down and down because each year comes up with a new justification of oh well we got to use the money for this or we got to use the money for that or we got to use the money for everything. And they're and they're doing it under the cover of PFD cuts instead of instead of being honest and talking about how much they're taxing Alaska families, how much of Alaska families' income they're taking out of Alaska families' pockets and diverting it over to government. Instead of being honest about that, they're trying to cover it by just talking about the resulting PFD amount and how lucky we are that we ought to be, you know, how thankful we are that we that we should be uh, that we're receiving that amount. 
And I guess that's what boggles my mind. I mean, do they, it, in, you know, because I don't think that anybody is, maybe it's my naivete. I just don't like to think that anybody is like, you know, twirling their mustache evilly in the background and, and doing this. They truly think that this is the best thing for Alaskans, that for all this government spend to be there, for government to take care of everything. I mean, I just, I, I'm trying to wrap my, I mean, history shows that, that's not the best road to tread. And yet these people continue to just fly against that and act like this is the best thing going. Well, you know, uh, Rob Myers ha has really done, has really done some good thinking on this. And it's that, you know, the, the biggest pot of money, biggest concentrated pot of money is flowing through government's hands. Right. I mean, the PFD, unfortunately, as, as opposed to, you know, the normal trust fund distribution, uh, going directly to the trust fund recipients, the PFD flows through government's hands. And, you know, and everybody goes, well, I got this, I got this pet project and, and look, you know, government's always paid for it in the past. I mean, we, we've, we've, we've built projects, we've built roads, we've done programs because we always had this oil money in the past. I know oil money's going down, but I still want all my, my pet projects. Right. I mean, I, it, it's coming from constituents to, to a degree. I still want all my pet projects. And, and the other projects are bad, but my project's really good. And by the time you add all that up, it takes more money. And, and since oil is no longer providing that money, where are you going to go for it? And, you know, in the 20 teens, we went to the, we went to the, to the, to the savings accounts to continue. Right. You know, right. Les a bon, les a bon temps role, you know, keep, keep the good times going. And, and now in the 2020s, we've run through the, we've run through the savings accounts. Where are we going to go now? And, and because of that one little thing, because of the fact the PFD goes through government's fingers on its way to, on its way to the people, yep, we're going to snap that. And we're going to tell you it's good for you. <laughs> right, right. And you're going to like it. And then you're going to, you're going to be satisfied with what we give you kind of thing. And, and, and aren't you lucky? We still let, you know, some of it trickle down. We won't yeah. for long. We, we can't, we can't keep this going. We can't keep this going forever. Um, uh, just like, you know, we finally ran through the SBR and ran through the CBR. We're going to finally run through the, the, the PFD, but while we're, while we're going, you know, you ought to be lucky that we're, that we're letting any of it trickle through, go, go on through our fingers and get down into your pockets. Chris, I think summates it. Well, if looting the PFD is bad for the economy, the two possible motivations are evil and stupid. Got to be one or the other or both. And maybe it's a little bit of both. I don't know. I think the greed and evil can be synonymous at this point. They just feel like they know better than us. Well, they know better than us, but but they would say with some justification that their constituents are still demanding it. You know, trained by the whole the whole era of we got so much money we don't want don't know what to right. do with it. Let's create this program, that program, that trained by that era and continued in the 20 teens by draining down the, the savings accounts. Constituents go, I need, you know, I need something. So let's go to government to get it. Well, like Rob said yesterday uh, or Monday, he still got constituents from his district walking in asking for money. It's amazing. New bill, this new HJR bill, which is the House Joint Resolution uh, bill from Cliff Grow. Uh, give us the tease on this and we'll come back to it here. Well, Cliff Grow's proposed this new constitutional amendment, got a lot of press yesterday. But we need to understand it in the context of what else is going on in Ways and Means. That bill's been referred to Ways and Means. We need to understand it in the context of what's going on, what else is going on in Ways and Means. And when you understand it in that context, the, the co-sponsorship by Jesse Sumner and Stanley Wright, two Republicans, becomes very curious. I'm not quite sure what they're up to, but we'll talk about that after the break. Brad Keithley, our guest uh, here on the Michael Luke Show. We're continuing with the weekly top three into number two, which is the new HJR House Joint Resolution Constitutional Amendment put forward by Cliff Grow and company to uh, roll the ERA and the corpus into one fund and then limit the draw on this. Uh, my one drawback that I see on this is that if they do that, they've immediately killed the statutory PFD because there's no longer an earnings reserve account to draw from for the formula to be factored on. Um, but I think there's some other issues too. Brad, what uh, what do you see when you look at this? Well, we got to we, we got to put this in context. There's on on March 1st, House Ways and Means introduced two committee bills uh, dealing with the PFD. One is HJR 7, which uh, constitutionalizes the PFD uh, at I believe current statutory levels. 
uh, and 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 simply adds another provision to the to the, the the permanent fund amendment to the constitution to say and we constitutionalize the PFD. This is how it should be calculated. Oh no, that 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 amendment simply says it will be done according to statute. So whatever the statute says uh, is incorporated into the constitution, and and that's how we're going to deal with it. That's HJR seven. HJR eight also introduced on the same day on March first. Uh, is is sort of an alternative proposal, as I understand it, which is we're going to constitutionalize both the the permanent fund, sort of in the same way HJR nine does, sort of in the same way Cliff Grow proposes. We're going to constitutionalize the permanent fund and protect the permanent fund and only draw only draw five percent, I believe, is the amount in that in that constitutional amendment. Only draw five percent into the earnings reserve, but at the same time, it also constitutionalizes the PFD. At the higher, if I recall correctly, at the higher of uh, either the current statutory calculation or POMB 5050, and says and says the the we're only going to draw five percent. We're going to constitutionalize the PFD at at that amount, and then what's left over from the PO from the constitutionalized POMB draw, what's left over uh, will go uh, will go to government. So those those two bills, those two constitutional proposed constitutional amendments were submitted as, as committee uh, proposals on March 1st. Now, now comes Cliff Grow's amendment, proposed amendment in that context uh, of those two bills already laying there. And what Cliff is saying is rather than the first bill, which would constitutional the first committee bill, which would constitutionalize the PFD, or the second committee bill, which would do what Cliff wants to do, but also add in constitutionalizing the PFD, his, his third, the Cliffs bill, HJR 9, uh, constitutionalizes uh, only the permanent fund and doesn't say anything uh, about, the, uh, about the PFD. So in the context, what's going on is the first two bills are protecting the P The first bill protects the PFD. The second bill protects the POMB draw, constitutionalizes the POMB draw and protects the PFD. And now Cliffs third bill only protects the uh, the POMB. In that context, it's clear that Cliff's bill is is undoing is is removing the protections for the PFD and right. putting the PFD at risk. Here's the here's the interesting thing. In that context, the third bill, Cliff's bill, gets two Republican co-sponsors, Jesse Sumner and Stanley Wright. Rather than rather than ad adopt or support one of the two committee bills, one of the proposed uh, uh, two committee amendments, they go along with Cliff and and a number of other Democrats, a number number of other in the minority, and 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 agree to co-sponsor a bill that's only protecting the PFD or only protecting the POMB, not protecting the PFD. And I find that really, really interesting. I I, I truly wonder what's in Jesse and Stanley's minds when they did that. Because it's it, I mean, it, it's clear in that context that that they're not they're not proposing to protect the PFD in any way, shape, or form. So I I um I, I I'm I'm troubled by Cliff's bill in that context. I'm troubled by Cliff's bill. Uh, I'm 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 especially troubled by the fact that it drew two Republican co-sponsors. Uh, one of the things that Donna points out in the uh, the uh, chat room as well is that HGR seven bypasses the appropriation process for the PFD as well. It says the state shall pay the PFD, which is what they did for years. It was basically just a transfer. It was a, it was it didn't even go through the appropriations process, and the legislature really wasn't even involved, which kind of goes back to where we were before. So yeah, very troubling that you've got protect the PFD, protect the POMV and the PFD. And then just protect the POMV. And of course, that's the only one that really gets any press is the one from the Democrats that's protect the POMV, protect the government spend essentially at the cost of everything else. Well, I think there's a couple of things going on with, with why it got publicity. I think Cliff pushed it and he and he and he was able to push it because he got by because he got Jesse and Stanley and 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 Stanley's support for it. So he was able to sell it as a bipartisan proposal. Uh, to uh, to protect protect the permanent fund, and then he pushed it out to you know, admittedly, probably what's a very receptive audience in the press. But but I and I don't and I don't think the the majority. I don't think the committee or the majority uh, did the same press uh, push with uh, with the first two bills. 
but I, but you know, just looking through it and looking at the context in which Cliff's bill is proposed, uh, in the context of the of the other two bills that are already sitting on Ways and Means's uh, desk, uh, it's just, uh, I mean, clearly, clearly we have a divide going on. Clearly, we have those who want to protect uh, the PFD with HJR seven. Clearly, those who want to protect uh, the the PFD and the POMV. What's what, frankly, is more in line with the fiscal policy working group proposal uh, in HJR eight. And then you have the other extreme going out the other extreme with protect the, the, the POMV only. But to have Jesse and to have Sumner and, and Wright on that last bill, protect the POMV only, is, um, is, is just a troubling development. What do you think it spells for the legislature in that regard? I mean, what do you think it spells for the majority and the minority in that? I mean, what do you say? Well, I, I, think, I think what should come through Ways and Means, if you look at the membership of Ways and Means, uh, what should come on through Ways and Means is is HJR uh, eight, which is to protect the POMV, uh, which is one one tenant of the fiscal policy working group, and it constitutionalize the protect the permanent fund, which is one tenant of the of the of the working group, and then constitutionalize the PFD, which is another tenant of the working group, and and HJR nine. Uh, just to protect the permanent fund only or protect the POMV only, I think should just should go by the wayside. But but it but it it, it there, there's some signal going on here with Jesse and Stanley signing on to to Cliff's bill, and it's not a good signal. Um, and I and I'm not quite sure what that means down the road. I, I think I think the committee's doing a good job, sort of bringing everything together, developing the context, putting bills out there that they can talk about. Uh, that that achieve the fiscal policy working group's objectives, building up the record for that, and then and then you know trying to push it on as a package, hopefully as a package, hopefully not anything breaking off into you know separate pieces. Um, I think they're doing a good job at that. But you know, Cliff's bill is just if it weren't for Jesse and Stanley uh, co-sponsoring, uh, Cliff's bill would be a just another bill, you know, sort of like. Uh, 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 Zach Fields thousand dollar PFD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we understand you're trying to get it, but yeah, uh, but with Jesse and Stanley on board, it's it's it, there's something else going on. Kevin says that uh, HDR seven is essentially what was proposed by the uh, fiscal policy working group. You say that you like eight more than seven, specifically because why? Because it protects the overdraw, right? Of the POMV is that what your your take is, right? Right. And I, and I, and, and there was parts of, I, I mean, Kevin would know better than I would, but I think there were parts of that in the fiscal policy working group as well. Certainly there, there's, there's a big chunk of the legislature that um, is concerned about that as well. And in, in, in terms of putting together a package that tries to compromise on everything, I think that's a, I think that's a useful part of it. I mean, basically overdraws, overdraws are, attacks on future generations, right? I mean, it's it's making this, it, it's sort of like what we did with savings during the 20 teens. We made this generation better by pulling easier, our life easier by pulling down the SBR and the CBR. So we didn't have to use any of our funds to pay for it. We were just using accumulated savings funds from the past, but it's the future generations, future generations who won't have a CBR of their own when they hit their fiscal, his, their fiscal challenges that are going to pay for it. So it's essentially, it's an intergenerational, intergenerational tax. Same thing's true from drawing down, you know, taking more than the 5%, using 5% as a proxy for what the overall returns are over time, uh, uh, real returns. Uh, it's, it's essentially a tax on future generations. So if we're going to stop taxes, you know, unnecessary, undisclosed, uh, uh, secret taxes, then we need to both protect the current PFD and we need to protect uh, raids on future generations by overdrawing the the the, P, the permanent fund. I think that uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, that that these folks continue to try and find ways when it's all said and done to basically pay lip service. I mean, Grow is quoted in the article from KTUU as saying, "Well, he supports the permanent fund and he'd like to see it enshrined, but of course." I mean, there's already a bill to do what he wants to do and protect the permanent fund, but he just put one in to protect the POMV, which again looks right back at the whole protecting government spend. I mean, you're right. I find the I find the motivations of Wright and Sumner at this point to be very opaque. I can't figure out exactly why 
they wouldn't support the two bills that are already out there. Uh, Kevin says we need both seven and eight to be passed uh, to do it. Well, I mean, there's already two bills in there. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do? Why wouldn't you support those? I, I, I can't reason as to why they would want to do that, other than to protect government spend, which seems kind of contrary to their constituency and to the mission statement. Well, protect government spend and protect the top twenty percent. I mean, Jesse, I've always. It's sort of like Will Stapp, right? I mean, Jesse Jesse talks a good game, but but when you sort of go through, parse through what his words are, it's always about protecting the top 20%. You know, use the PFD if we have to. PFD is nice, but, you know, use it if we have to. Don't tax, don't tax Alaskans without recognizing the PFD's a tax. And, 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 and Cliff's b- bill, you know, would be, could be viewed by some as a protect the top 20%. Uh, bill because it's going to protect the the permanent fund corpus. It's going to protect it out into the future, uh, let it build up over time, uh, and 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 allow all the earnings to be used uh, to be used for government, so that you so that you don't have to tax the top twenty percent to 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 get any money in there for government. And and so, you know, viewed from that angle, I sort of can th- sort of figure out what what's going through Jesse's mind. Stanley, I have no idea what's going through his mind. I mean, I. I, I, I've understood Stanley to be more in line with 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 you know Republican thinking that that we've seen in the in the majority about the importance of the PFD, but you know maybe maybe, I, maybe I've misunderstood what Stanley's doing. Uh, Brad Keithley, number two now, pretty much finalized. Finalized. We've got uh, three minutes here. Can you give us number three? Hit us with number three on the way in. Yep. So a lot of press about Willow, the, the administration's Willow decision. Uh, uh, Rob Myers told me last night that uh, the word is that the administration, the Biden administration's decision on Willow is going to come out tomorrow. Uh, there's a lot riding on on uh, on the Willow decision, not from the standpoint of state fiscal. We talked about this before uh, for various reasons, because it's on federal lands, not state lands, because the the tax code the the production tax code allows deferment of taxes well actually a holiday for taxes for several several years from new developments uh willow doesn't mean much in the in the near or even the intermediate term from the state fiscal standpoint but from a state economy standpoint from from jobs from construction activity from you know uh, uh contracts being let from you know everything from food services all the way up to construction of ice roads and every and construction of, of pads and everything else. It means a lot to the overall Alaska economy. So we're going to find out this week, maybe tomorrow, uh, very soon what the Biden administration is going to do on this. And, and frankly, I, I, I still expect the Biden administration to approve uh, the, what the BLM proposed, which is the three pad alternative. What Conoco has said is the minimum that it's going to take for the project to be economic. Uh, I still anticipate the Biden administration approving that, frankly, because of Lisa. They need Lisa in the Senate. And I think uh, I think she's made very clear that her support of the Biden administration um, uh, hinges on uh, their approval of the three pad alternative. So I, I still expect them to do that. But, you know, there's a lot of pushback on it, a lot of environmental uh, community pushing back, trying to uh, trying to kill the whole thing with either, you know, conditioning it on two pads or, or, or denying it altogether like they have pebble. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see this week, but big deal for the Alaska economy. There's going to be a lot of press about it, but keep in mind, it's big for the Alaska economy. It's not big for Alaska's fiscal situation. It is not right. a cure in any way, shape or form. Right. For because again, it, for the economy, because it creates jobs and there's add on industries and everything else, not for the fiscal picture of the state itself, because the state is only slated to make like five billion dollars over the course of the life of the whole thing, which is in the scheme of things is not a lot of money when we're spending five or six billion dollars a year. It's not a lot of money in the long run. Right. And that's pushed back because of the because of the uh, the way that the tax code works. That's pushed back into into the later years in any event. So not much money and not much money to the state. And it's not coming anytime soon. What are you watching this week, Brad? We got about two minutes here. What are you watching this week to ca- you know to kind of keep your eye on, so to speak? Well, um, Willow certainly will be it will be a big deal from the standpoint of the economy. Uh, the build up to next Monday's uh, Ways and Means Committee uh, meeting uh, is going to be interesting. 
Uh, next uh, this, on the schedule, if I understand it, for Ways and Means next Monday is public testimony on the two on HJR seven and HJR eight, um, and hopefully there will be a lot of support uh, for those two, not only from other legislators but from the uh, from the public as well, and sort of how that builds up during the week to next uh, Monday evening's uh, uh, hearing. Uh, is going to be, if, I, if I've got the dates right, somehow correct me if I'm wrong, uh, how that sort of builds up to next uh, to the to the next uh, 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 Ways and Means Committee hearing uh, is going to be interesting as well. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can follow him on Facebook where he posts up his weekly chart of the week and everything else. Plus, he's got a uh, public testimony is on Saturday as well from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. on that. All right. Well. So, so, so I'll be I'll be focused on public testimony on Saturday as opposed to next Monday. Yeah. Um, but uh, you could follow Brad along on Facebook where he posts his chart of the week and everything else. He's also got his weekly column in the Alaska landmine. Uh, and uh, you can, uh, you can argue with him on Twitter too. He, I'm sure he loves that. That's uh, that's fun stuff. You always bring the best news, Brad. You always bring the good stuff. Um, you know uh, it's, it's interesting to watch. Uh, to see how these things are laying out. These HJR, the resolutions, the three resolutions, I think are going to be some things to watch. They're all part of this plan for the fiscal policy working group, which we'd like to see come together as a whole thing. But 